<laughs> hopefully, <laughs> hopefully we're live. <laughs> I, uh, they say you should never start a stream with uh, an apology, but I'm afraid I have to. I greatly underestimated what was needed. Uh, so I'm missing a display, and so I'm kind of blinded to the comments. Uh, I thought I had the cables, and uh, what I had ordered several years ago was actually uh, micro HDMI. was not micro HDMI. It was uh, the mini HDMI, so it won't quite fit <clears throat> in my Raspberry Pi. So my apologies for that. So one of the things that the reason for this stream was very simple, that I had requests from a lot of you that wanted me to just open it up for questions. And so I have a list from the community that I'm going to go through, but I'll, I'll have to look back on this other computer to pick up, uh, to pick up what, uh, what your questions are today. And then we'll, we'll try to get those on. I don't have anything that will display yet because like I said, the, I need the raspberry Pi. I need one more display to be able to see what's going on. So. So I um, so why don't we start there? I have a, a question here from the community. This is from Wai Leong4326, and he asked, what happened to the old computer and software companies from back in the day, like 1960 through the 1980s? How did the economies, the market, and politics affect this new industry? We often get a computer history museum kind of official ver version, but I'm wondering what the overall vibe of the industry is like. So, yeah, so <laughs> this is kind of, this is, this touches home. Uh, you know, the, um, of course, you know, the, the microprocessor industry all started back about the 1970s when Intel introduced the 4004. That was a four bit CPU and uh, it really wasn't useful for making computers but it was useful for making calculators. And so that's where it ended up. The, um, they were pretty successful with that. And Intel made memory at about the same time, but they were running into com competition from the Japanese and they could not match the prices that the Japanese were charging for their memory. It was a lot less than Intel could even uh, make their memory for it. So Intel decided to exit the uh, memory business and concentrate solely on CPU production, which is probably a good thing because with them able to do that, they were able to start rolling out new machines. And these things came out about once every 12 months. Some of them took a little longer. Some of them took about 18 months. But usually you could bet every every 12 months there was a new machine coming out that was bigger and better than its previous predecessor. So the next one that came out was sort of the 8080. And the 8080 was, eh, it was, it had a, it had eight bit, but the address lines, there was only 14 bits of those as I remember. So they were kind of, they were kind of crippled on the amount of memory you could use. And so, yeah, they weren't, they, they just weren't all that great. And so we didn't really see any development uh, through the early seventies, but, in 72 and 73, the 8080 came out, and that made it possible to build microcomputers. And MITS, uh, I forget what the manufacturing of industrial technologies or something like that. I forget what they did, what the acronym was. Maybe you guys know. But that was a that was an invention. That company was the invention of Ed Reynolds. Ed was the designer of something called the S100 bus. So the demand for that type of machine was really being driven by people that were hardware focused. You really had two major groups, in the, at least in the U.S., that were really pushing hard for microcomputers. The first one was the amateur radio group. They wanted to use it for packet radio, and you know they 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 could send digital messages across the airwaves, and they also wanted it to send they they images. I don't know why you would want to do that, but they did, and they also wanted to do slow scan video that developed later. So that was one of the first demands for it. The second demand came from the model railroaders, the the guys that would build these large model train sets, and they wanted to be able to manage the 
the trains that were running on the tracks. They wanted to automate the switching and the siding of, of engines that were running in these. I mean, these, we're not talking about like a, a simple loop around a, uh, around a door. We're talking some of these that, like my uncle's, that occupied his entire basement. Uh, and and he probably had the ability to run, I think, six trains at once on the thing, which was nothing compared, like if you went up to the uh, Science and Industry Building in Chicago, they, I think that is still the largest um, railroad. I think there's one other that's bigger than that one, but it's huge. So those were those were hardware people, and they really wanted it. I, I mean, I was working on Plato at the time, so I wasn't really too interested. And what we would jokingly refer to as baby computers, elitism, that sort of. But uh, so the software people didn't really get interested in it until later when there was things like operating systems and compilers and things for us to use. So the S100 was really a place for people that were <clears throat> hardware focused. They could build their own boards. And they. I think the MIT sold for... $500 or something like that, uh, unassembled, and you had to solder it together yourself. And then, or you could pay them an extra 200 bucks and they would do it. Um, I just can't imagine that, that $200 in labor would pay for, I mean, these things required quite a few chips being on these uh, systems. But the thing that made S100 bus computers so easy to build was they didn't need much. They just needed a unregulated power supply. And then you had... Uh, basically, a motherboard that was that had I don't know uh, 10, 11, 12 different S100 slots on it, and so yeah, your CPU was on a an S100 card, your memory was on an S100 card. You just slotted them in and expanded it using the buses. It was called S100 because it had a hundred different connectors uh, on the uh, on the bus. So the bus had data addressing voltages. Uh, that you could use. And then each card had to have its own power regulation uh, in order to, to break out the, I think it was 19 volts that came off the power supply, but I, I don't know. I could be wrong about that. But I do know that the CPUs all needed 12 and 5 volt, and then they weren't going to work very well with higher voltages. They would probably blow up. So they had to step it down. <clears throat> the, um, the things that kind of drove the business back then was, it was very low demand. I mean, you had a lot of hobbyists that were interested in it, and you had a relatively high cost in order to build up your machine, and and the return on it wasn't so good, right? I mean, $200 to assemble? I mean, wow, <laughs> that's cheap uh, by today's standards. The um, So what happened to a lot of the systems, like MITS, in fact, went under. Uh, they, you know, initially they got swamped with orders, and then as new machines came out, you had the MSI, which came out, which was a, a clone basically of the MITS. It was prettier. Most of the systems you see that show S100 bus, S100 uh, bus machines, they always show the MSI because it was prettier than the Altar 8080 from MITS, but. They, you had to single instruct them. You had to hit buttons and enter your program. And then if you powered the thing off, it lost everything you did. So the first thing most people did, most of the engineers did, was try to get ta uh, cassette tapes uh, hooked up to them so they could save their programs off. There was uh, groups like the Homebrew Computer Club that grew up around that that machine. And they met, you know, in San Francisco and trade swap lies and ideas for boards. There were magazines like Byte Magazine and Dr. Dobbs Journal and uh, later Creative Computing that sprung up to help people along with not only building. Byte was more hardware focused. They had some software, but not too much. Digital Research got interested in starting to build an operating system for it called CPM. And that kind of pushed things along for that because now we could... Now you had programs that you could run and then you could store them and they would use, you know, floppy drives off of deck machines and they'd, they'd find, you know, stuff in the trash from Shugart. I mean, so they would basically go on these raiding parties and, and look through all the trash in the tech industry to find out if they threw something away that could be fixed and, and then used. So that was kind of the, the scope of things back then. My, uh, 
My brother-in-law did, he was a hardware engineer for Motorola and did quite a bit of work with the uh, early S100s, but the things were so big, they were noisy and they, they, they took, they drank a lot of power and yeah, but by, by the time you added up everything on it, you were probably looking at a machine that was seven to $10,000. So that wasn't going to work in the home environment, right? The other problem that you had was as the there was a need to move forward, right? The 8080, wanted to, they wanted to move to 16-bit, move to the 8086. But the problem with that is, is that there wasn't an operating system that was supported. And digital research worked on CPM 86 for a long time. They kept running into bugs and it got delayed year after year after year. By the time they got it done, IBM had already entered the marketplace with their PC and they had MS-DOS running and S100 sort of, it didn't die, but it slowed down pretty heavily. In the meantime, Apple had built up a business that I saw something that said they were an S100 bus. No, no, Apple was a, as an Apple bus. They, they never did anything that was industry standard back then, but it was open. They published the standards. They published their uh, assembler code for the ROM. So there was a lot of clones that came up around the Apple II and II Plus and IIe. Uh, that machine sold probably millions of copies uh, because it was relatively cheap and the expansions for it were relatively inexpensive as well in comparison to the S100s. <clears throat> Plus you didn't need a degree in electrical engineering to make the thing work. So, yeah, it got a lot of uh, us software people interested in working on it. There was the PC came along and it did not sell very well initially, but it did. The sales did take off because IBM pushed it hard into the business customers and they liked it. And then home users who wanted to have something that they could learn on at home for work, they bought one as well. But they were fairly expensive back then. So I say I would say that the 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 industry was there was a lot of companies that came in, but the demand was initially slow, and so a lot of them didn't have the money they needed to make the jump to the next to leap to the next technology. They they had invented their eight bit world and they were successful in that, but they didn't have enough income coming into the business that would support moving to a sixteen bit or later. A 32-bit, and so by the time you got to the 90s, there was huge shakeouts. I mean, there was lots of companies that were dropping off and and going under because they 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 just didn't have the marketplace in order to support any kind of growth. So yeah, I mean that's what. But there, I mean, God, it, it, that whole era from late 1970s until the web bubble burst in 93, 94, I would call it frantic. I mean, it was hard to keep up with it. I mean, there I worked um, probably 12 to 16 hour days back then because people were rushing to technology in order to beat their competitors with new programs, faster systems, and quicker ways to do things than their competitors could respond to. And that resulted in a lot of shakeout with even in industries that were non-related to technology. Uh, a lot of the steel industry, for example, started consolidating uh, around that time frame. So yeah, there was just, <laughs> it was crazy. So sorry for that uh, long, long uh, dissertation, but let me see. <laughs> let me see here. Oh my, there's a lot of people here. Um, I'm gonna move the mic over here. I'm sorry I turned in my back to you, but uh, let's see. What do I do outside of YouTube software? So uh, David, I was, I was a, I started out as an operator, was my real first job on a Honeywell H2020. Uh, I worked on Play-Doh and I was a programmer there, but, um, yeah, I started out, it was a programming operator job working on, on COBOL. So uh, we we had to run what we wrote, <laughs> sort of that. So yeah, you could find out how bad it was. Um, I would say, 
um, more of a, I, I, I didn't, I didn't like application programming. So I kind of drifted more toward systems programming. And that's why I stayed working for companies like Burroughs and AT&T and IBM. So I, I, I just, I didn't have the patience for application programming. And, you know, the one thing that you can do to really make people angry is lose money. <laughs> if you, uh, if you crash an operating system, well, they're not going to yell at you too long, but if you lose money for them, they'll probably, yeah, they'll be, they'll be trying to run you over with their car. So yeah, I didn't, didn't really like that kind of, that part of the business. Um, what's my take on, uh, Hovas asks, what's my take on Broadcom and VMware? Well, I, you know, I, I left, I used to use VMware quite a bit, but they got kind of expensive. They're, as the CPU models grew for ma these massive numbers of CPUs, the model of charging per core got insane. I mean, we... Our shop at Raytheon went from paying uh, VMware, I think, around $30,000 a year in licenses. As we upgraded the systems, we had to start paying $120,000. So, and that was basically for the same number of computers that were just more cores in them. So it just, yeah, I, I, the, at Qualcomm, you deserve what you're getting. That's all I can say about that. Uh, Qualcomm has never been one of my favorite. They, uh, in the Linux world, they're always problematic because they don't standardize on anything. They, um, this isn't a dig on Broadcom. It's just their policy. They could fix it. They don't standardize on anything and then reuse a baseline driver that's compatible with the old one and then put the new features in the new driver. They, they could recreate something from scratch. That's why your Wi-Fi boards don't work when they go over to Linux. And that's why your Bluetooth doesn't work when you go over to Linux. It's because if you look at the list of drivers for Broadcom in, in Linux, it's, it's, it's a mile long. It's just a, probably every product line that they've ever had is in there as a unique driver. That's, that's crazy. That's just crazy. Um, Eric says, I haven't seen many of your vids in quite a while. Not sure why this one. So, yeah, YouTube has a, YouTube has kind of a problem in, in that they only notify the first 500 people on the list. And they randomize that. I mean, I can imagine if you had, if you were like MKBHD and you had 12 million people, that that would take quite a long time to notify all 12 million people that he had a video. And probably by the time you got all those notifications out, he would, the video would be done. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, probably. <laughs> yeah. It's not, not too good. Uh, yeah, you probably saw, uh, let's see who said that. Uh, Fabrizio is talking about Snap. So Snap has a couple of problems. There's been uh, vulner. There's been there's been malware cited that's been released through Snaps, and I, I've been saying that that was going to be a possibility because Canonical doesn't care. They let the developers kind of self manage the Snap repository which that's really not a good idea. They should really do something like Docker does where you have uh, people that are certified as the official release of like Canonical's Ubuntu or even Docker has their own official releases of Docker in there. So you're pretty much assured that you've got a company, you got a belly button behind it that you can push if something goes wrong. But it, and if it's just like the, if it's, pardon me for saying this, but if it's like the the Microsoft uh, store where it's a free for all, yeah, malware is going to come into your system. And I I also noticed that there's also a problem with the M1 and M2 chips from Apple that have a a major dis, uh, vulnerability that apparently cannot be patched now. I would bet my uh, Apple will figure out a way to do that. They always have in the past. There's ways to rectangle around problems in the CPU. But 
It might be that they'll have to recall them. <laughs> That'll be interesting if that has happened. Hey, Joe, from Tech for Fun. Good to see you. Grove Rockin. I have a question from, from, oh, a slow scan video. So what is a slow scan video? What is it? It's kind of, have you ever seen a fax machine from the old days work where it would, I don't know, maybe you haven't seen, well, the original fax machines used a drum and they would sort of paint from left to right an image. Slow scan video is kind of the same way where it, it doesn't do frames per second. It, it just kind of paints an image and then goes back and starts over and scanning a new part of the image goes back. It's for real low, um, low bandwidth lines. So yeah, that's slow scan video. It, it does, it shows progression, but it, it's not real time video. So that, it was kind of one of the early technologies along with facts and, and those kinds of things that you could use to send images over the telephone lines, or in this case, over the radio signals. Oh, thank you, Tech for Fun. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks for the compliment on the beard. Um, Raphael asks, are there important, any important tips? Are there any important tips for a noob in Linux asking for a friend? <laughs> Uh, I don't know what you're trying to do with it. So, if um, if you if you wanna if if you wanna leave me a more detailed note, it probably direct you. I've I've got some videos on when you're first coming into Linux. If you on helping you decide what distro to use and then what how to pick up the kinds of packages you might be interested in, but. Linux is just a base operating system. It does very little for you other than it gets you started down the road for choosing the applications that you really want to run. So you can, you can think of it as a framed-in house, but there's no furniture. You have to supply that with the applications that you want to run, and then it could help you better as to which, which kinds of things that would help a noob. So if you're wanting to learn how to program and so forth. So let's go back to the, the list here. Uh, Mana Banana asks, great name. He asks, uh, what software pro projects excite you right now as a Linux desktop user? Well, there's really two things. Um, you know, the, the two things that I've been spending the most time on recently is um, assigning uh, external graphics processing units that don't have their own displays and using them as accelerators. So um, that has been a challenge because X11 only allows one of those eGPUs for, per each window. So whereas Wayland, you can have up to 32. It's some ridiculous amount that I would never use, but maybe if I was in, uh, maybe if I was in the world of Jensen's uh, H1, uh, what, no, the B100 and B200 machines, yeah, I might I might be more interested in then, but <laughs> I don't have I don't have two hundred fifty thousand dollars to spend on a graphics system. <laughs> do you? <laughs> if you do, buy me one too. Um, so yeah, and the second one is um, I've been doing a lot of work right now with AI. It's a personal interest. I just want to learn more about it. I want to know how to do my own models, and I'm not interested in using it in the cloud. I, I don't like cloud environments. So I've been learning more about like the, uh, there's one called the LM. Um, uh, I'll have to, I'll, I'm going to have to do a video on this. There's Olama and another one called the LM Project. And that one actually allows you to use multiple models. It's really good if you're just getting started because it will look at your machine and tell you if the model is going to run fast enough on it or not. Uh, and so these are taking smaller models down that you can run locally without having to, um, without having to sign on to the cloud to use it. So uh, Pro Varakin had a question. He said, was there a perceptible time when hobbyists started focusing on software instead of hardware? Yeah, so like I said earlier, it started in hardware. 
It was the hardware people that really moved the microelectronics demand along, and, and we all got involved later uh, and move into it once there was an operating system and there was some compilers that we could use uh, to do that. Because typically, it's always the hardware people that prep the hardware to work and start to create the interfaces in the hardware needed to plug an operating system into it and then define how a compiler could be optimized for that hardware. So it's they're always really the first ones in, and without them, you can't really, it's kind of a chicken and egg. You gotta have the hardware first, and you have to have it in a state that can accept an operating system and a compiler. Once you have those two things, then you can actually start building applications that run on it. And so that was when we, that's when we started getting interested, the software guys. Because here we, we didn't have to, you know, go track down cloud environments or, well, they didn't call them clouds. They, they called them um, uh, share, time sharing systems back then, but they were usually pretty expensive to use. And they were, you were, again, using somebody else's hardware to do it. So, yeah, it always, it always starts with the hardware, always. Um, I saw Opticon said... Do you keep old computers and repurpose them as, let's say, file servers using Linux, or do you replace legacy PCs with modern, more power-efficient units? So I do pass older hardware down, but I will tell you that years ago, I've been more interested in low-power computer designs. So you won't, you'll find some Intel in my lab here, but most of it is ARM. I, uh, I just... I don't mind waiting, and and if you put enough ARM processors against like like using Gluster or something, you can get the same relative speed out of it bandwidth wise, uh, without with a much smaller footprint for electrical use. I mean, a lot of these huge file servers that people go and get out of you know the eBay's of the world or the refurbishing companies like they're pulling down servers. Well, first of all, those machines make a heck of a amount of racket, and, and, and I don't like noise. I, I, I've been around servers so long, it, it's just, it's not something I want to hear again. Um, the second problem with it is, is they use a lot of power. They're not exactly efficient. Uh, they're trying to get that way, but they still use an awful lot of power. And again, uh, you know, one of, the th one of the sites that I remember well is we had IBM's cloud environment had just racks and racks and racks of servers. It's probably in that location, there was probably close to, I would say, 25,000 servers. And just one time, one of the engineers said, you got to see this. And so we went outside and we went to the power line that had the uh, meter on it. That thing was spinning so fast. I swear, it, it was smoking. <laughs> it was literally smoking. So I was like, nah, I don't, I don't need that. I, I don't need that. It, of course, wasn't mechanical. It was digital. But, man, that thing was really moving. Uh, so, yeah, I do repurpose machines, and uh, I prefer to use ARM. However, to be honest, lately, the ARM boxes have... It seems like there's been a loss of interest in the small form factor. And so a lot of the companies like Odroid and even even the the Pi company is they're they they're kind of dragging their feet a little bit, I feel. They're not as they're not churning out product as fast as they used to, uh, or keeping things current like they used to. Like uh Odroid, for example, on their operating system is still trying to support a 4.4 kernel on Linux, which is not good because that kernel has been out of support for, what, six years now? Something like that? It's been a long time since that was in. So let me see what you guys have. Ah, uh, okay. So uh, Raphael has a follow-up. He said he is an IT professional using Windows. So, uh, so you're probably, are you an administrator, a programmer? So if you're a, if the so the it doesn't if you're an administrator it doesn't really matter what version of 
of Linux you take take on because the command structures are similar. The only things that are going to be different is the type of packages and package management that you're going to run into are going to be different, but the basic commands are all going to be the same from one distro to another. Um, so networking, there's th there's unfortunately, there's three different ways to do networking on Linux. And that doesn't even count, or that doesn't even count the InfiniBand stuff. You, you know, Linux is is kind of the it's kind of the it has been the largest server um, deployment of any operating system to date. Hmm. And there's good reason for that. Um, although you, you, I, I noticed that. I like to look at the statistics every once in a while, and I, I've seen this trend where, where the number of Linux servers, the count, has been going down. And the reason for that is because the number of processor cores is going up. So basically, it's less servers that support the same load, and so you don't need as many copies of Linux to do that. And so, yeah, yeah, that's, that's kind of funny. Nobody really, I mean, in today's world, in the IT world, nobody cares about what operating system you're running because they all run Docker and that's all, or they use Kubernetes. And so they don't really care what the base operating system is as long as it hosts their loads that they want to run. So, yeah, <laughs> nobody, nobody cares. Um, let's see. Karazdikov, Karazdistovkov. As, this might be a stupid one, but there's no stupid questions, only stupid answers. So only if it's possible, my knowledge ends at the C++ level. So in order to run some code, we need some binary exe files on Linux. So the dumb question is, why can't Linux run exe Windows uh, files? Ah, this is a good question, actually. So let's start with there, the operating systems between Linux and Windows are quite different, and they use different APIs to do open files, create memory space to ex and call in the execution blocks. All of that is quite different. So expecting a Windows application to run natively on Linux is impossible. There is something called Wine, uh, which will allow you to run a selection of Windows applications by translating the API calls to Linux and then running them natively. That will work. Uh, there is something that AT&T wrote way back in the Unix days called the ELF spec. Uh, and ELF stands for Executable Linkable Format. It was designed at the time when there was there was Motorola processors, there was PowerPC, there was there was ARM, there was Intel, there was MIPS, there was a lot of different there was DEC and the Alpha. There was a lot of different chipsets that were around and were running Unix. AT&T was trying to create a universal execution format for Unix. And the way ELF works, or the way they envisioned it to work, it never actually occurred, and I'll explain why, uh, was to put a flag in the front that identified the processor that this section of code applied to. So it's kind of like the universal binary that Apple has to run Intel and ARM code. On the same on the same binary, uh, it just branches to the code that's ARM, or it branches to the code that's Intel. That, that was essentially what ELF did too. It would branch to so you would have code in there for all five processors or four processors, and then it would it would branch to the appropriate line of code. There was two problems with that. First, it made your binaries a lot bigger. And the second one was, at the time, everybody thought AT&T was trying to take over the world, and they were against them. IBM and DEC and all of them, HP, they all lined up against what AT&T was trying to do uh, because they were trying to unify Unix, and they were like, no, we can't have that. You know, they, they didn't want a unified Linux, they, or excuse me, Unix. They, so, yeah, 
That would be the that would have been the least of their problems, and especially if you had a unified executable format. Now your your programs could run anywhere, right? They actually were setting up the compiler so you could flag what one what code to generate and, and then put it into the ELF binary, but it never got anywhere. The ELF format format, by the way, still supports it. It's just nobody uses it. So. Um, and ELF, by the way, is used by Linux. <laughs> yeah, it is still used by Linux. Um, oh, Dev. Well, I mean, all the modern tools are on Linux. You got Ans so you have Ansible, you have Chef, you have Puppet, you have um, Spinnaker. All of those are available. So. Yeah, I mean, DevOps is, is huge on Linux. I mean, that's the game anyway. It's huge. So, yeah, you're in the right place. That's all I'm going to say. What did I do and where I was employed? Uh, I started out at the University of Illinois on a project called Plato 5. And that was part of Searle. That was while I was a student. And uh, I didn't know anything about computers when I started, but I learned quite a bit when I graduated. Uh, I got uh, my first real job was working in up in, in the old card to print batch type of processing on mainframes. And they upgraded me uh, because I completed one of the projects five years ahead of schedule. And so they wanted me on board with them. And so I worked for them for about, I guess, uh, close to. 11 years and they were closing down the office. Otherwise I would have stayed. They wanted me to move to Chicago and I was like, uh -uh, no, no, thanks. Don't want to go to Chicago. So uh, I went and, and found a job with AT&T, which is really what I wanted to learn was Unix anyway. So I worked in the data systems group there, um, which they, that was the organization that built and sold the 3B2, the commercial versions of Linux, or I keep saying Linux, the commercial ver versions of Unix uh, for business customers. So we had machines that ran all the way from desktops all the way up to supercomputers. They they had they had machines that were that fast, like the B4000, the 3B4000, which you never hear about. Uh, they didn't sell too many of them, but man, were they fast. Um, uh, I'm talking like... Uh, uh, pyramid style fast machines the uh, further time further time then uh, I went out on my own for a while and then came back in and and got a job with IBM and started working on the we I was in a uh, the group that did the strategy for the company on their e-business strategy going forward on how to build websites and and what kinds of tools were needed to set that up and make it easy for us to get things done. So based on our recommendation, they went out and procured a company that we wanted. And, uh, and then we started marketing that product to uh, large, large customers that wanted websites. And so I spent most of my time doing that. Got into portals, got into cloud, and, and then they wanted me to go work in R&D. And so I did. I worked in R&D for IBM for about three years. Um, and it was, R and D is funny. Uh, it's, uh, anytime, anytime there's something new and it looks like it's going to be slightly successful, everybody will just flood over from the project they're working on because they all want it. The, like I'm sure with AI right now, I'm sure that there is nobody working on any other R and D projects at IBM right now. They probably have all moved over onto AI. That's, that's, that it was just hilarious. If you got there first, you were in, but it was like a, mu a game of musical chairs where you had 15 chairs that you could, you had to get there early or that you didn't have a seat. So, <laughs> yeah, that was kind of funny. And then I uh, worked for uh, Raytheon uh, when IBM started divesting everything and, and, and uh, downsizing or laying massive amounts of people off. I saw it coming and I got out of the way before they got me. So I, I think I, beat the massive layoff. They, they laid off about 150,000 people that at the end of that calendar year. And I got over onto a new job about three months ahead of time because I saw it coming. 
um, there's always signs. You can see it. You can see it coming. So get out of the way. Uh, and I worked for Raytheon in the uh, ESD division, which was their intelligence division. We did uh, we did tactical systems for high altitude uh, aircraft. So yeah, it was fun. It was a lot of fun. Learned a lot. It was like drinking from a fire hose. That's all I can say. It was a lot of stuff and a lot of things to learn in, in a very short term period of time. Uh, let's see. And then, then of course, retired. So now I don't do nothing. And, and I'm damn good at it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's the uh, Bob says. Bob Mosimo says he was at an arm conference once where the guy said, "Arm, we were we were we were born on batteries." Yeah, that's that's true. The I remember the first time that I remember reading about arm was when they plugged it in for a demonstration, and they took the power away and the chip was still running on the on just the residual charge of the capacitors that were left in the power supply, and it ran. They let it run and it ran for like three days before it finally drained it. It was using so little power that they didn't need that big a power supply to drive it. So yeah, ARM's very efficient in, in terms of power draw. Although I don't think they're quite that way anymore. Their ARM is starting to having having to to use to introduce a lot of the technologies that the big boys like Intel and AMD have in order to be competitive in the server market. So yeah. So they're starting to adopt the higher power draw things that that were not core to their business at one time. Yeah, Ansible gang here too, David. I use Ansible even in my home lab. I love it. It's just, it, yeah, it saves so much time. Uh, Daniel Cotman had a had a question, uh, actually a suggestion. Home lab, new minimalist hardware that runs open source based virtualization like XMP and G, for the purposes of learning as well as having a secure separation between operating systems. Yeah, that's that's a that's a boatload of stuff right there. Um, yeah, uh, the only thing is though, I'm not a big fan of XMP and G. I had a bad experience with it, and uh, it was not their fault. It was my fault. But but. I was upgrading from one release level to another. I used it originally, and uh, because all the guys at work they they love Zen, and they were like, "You got to try this." You got to. I was like, "Okay, I'll try it," and I, I started using it. But I really have three problems with X XCPNG. First, you have to have Windows in order to install it. I don't want Windows anywhere near my lab. Sorry, I don't want it. Just no, forget that idea. And the second thing is, if you want the orchestration, you either have to pay for it or you have to compile it and use their their version of the test the test version of the software, which that's okay. I don't mind doing that. But it's the Windows part that just drives me nuts. I'm just like, no, I don't, no, no. <laughs> um, the, the problem I ran into was I was trying to upgrade it from one major version to another. I was following the steps and I skipped one. My fault. I mean, it was my fault. And it the the migration did not go well. When I got all done, I was like, okay, I'll just restore from backup and then we'll go from there. Until I discovered that as part of the upgrade process, in their infinite wisdom, they deleted the backup. Wow, that was dumb. <laughs> that was really dumb. Uh, and so, yeah, I, I'm sorry. I won't use them anymore. Um, but I can use Proxmox. Uh, I like them. They actually have a, a GUI that runs on the web, and it's fine, and it works great. does everything X, XCPNG does, only a lot easier. Um, and it doesn't require Windows. <laughs> so, yeah. I don't know. Maybe they, did they get rid of their Windows requirement for setup and install? Uh, if they did, maybe uh, I'll reconsider it. But yeah, <laughs> no, uh, no windows for me, thanks. Um, oh, this is a good question. This is from Capability Snob. It said, DEC democratized computer access in the 60s and 70s. 
Why did they fail to do it again when the microcomputer took off? I know all the usual media and talking points about IBM, but it doesn't seem like the whole story. So it was just the opposite. It wasn't IBM that destroyed DEC. DEC actually destroyed IBM, and they did it in pieces. They took billions of revenue away from IBM because IBM refused to re respond to the mini computer market until it was too late. I remember IBM's answer was the System 3 and the Series 1 to DEC. That covered their large machines and their smaller ones. Um, the System 3 was a good machine. It sold a lot, became the AS400. Uh, as far as IBM hardware was concerned, the, hard, the hardware that IBM makes is great. The software is awful. Um, but the hardware that they make is, is beautiful. It's well designed. It's just the software is like, what the hell were you thinking? Um, the Series 1 had a lot of problems. I remember one customer, it was a late major insurance company that was attempting to move the Series 1s out to their, um, their insurance salespeople, the, the agents, the insurance agents that worked independently. And they needed access to all of the, all the files and data that was inside of the insurance company in order to, you know, what was this person do? What, what, kind of, what kind of investments can I, you know, get them interested in and use in our, our products? So they, they were trying to get the Series 1 deplo deployed, and it, it just didn't work. It just flat didn't work. There was a year went by. It still wasn't working. It was still having problems. Two years went by. It still wasn't working. Finally, when I was working for AT&T, we went in and we said, look, we just, we just talked to one of the guys at, in the, in, in, that was on the project. And I said, would you mind if we tried with, with a 3B2? And they were like, yeah, please give us some help because <laughs> we're just dying. We can't get this thing to work. And so we, we actually came in and we, we installed a 3B2. We put it up and run it. It did the job. And, and we, were done. <laughs> we were done, I think it all told from start to finish, you had to go through all these trials and everything. It was about eight months or something like that. So they were still dorking around with the Series 1 trying to get it to work. Um, as far as DEC is concerned, why they didn't adopt the microcomputer? Arrogance. Simple word, arrogance. I worked for DEC for about a month, and I couldn't stand it. Um, yeah, they were arrogant, and... Uh, they they would not hear it was like microcomputers. What did you say? By the time DEC realized their mistake, um, they jumped in and they started building the DEC PC and the Alpha chip. Those were both of them were great machines. Just a little too late. Uh, yeah, a little too late to save the company. And it's back to that old problem again, right? You need revenue to support development and to do new things. And without that, you die. And that's exactly what happened. They died, and trying to trying to modernize. Ah, uh, the, the Windows part. Thank God for that. <laughs> See, it's been a while. Yeah, I don't. I don't. Usually, if I get burned, I don't go back. Uh. Sorry, I have to keep turning away from you, but I'll get this fixed. Uh. All right, so let's see if I have any over here. So this this one came from David Weeks. I think running a lesson or a series of lessons on compiling would be a serious flex of GNU Linux, starting with kernels and then some primetime apps, given that I can trivially favor my kernel and modules to specific uses, I never consider any other options as viable. Add to the immutability of the GPL and licenses, no other option in my IT infrastructure. That's great, but IPL is dying. Um, that, that's the GNU public license. It's dying. And the reason why it's dying 
is companies are basically saying, okay, developer, you want to put that software in our company? Change your license to Apache or MIT or we won't take it. So, yeah, it the, the, the it used to be 10 years ago, the GPL made up 80% of the licenses. There, there's companies that track it. Um, I did a video on this recently, and um, there's uh, they're down to about 25% of the packages that are based on GPL anymore. And that continues to decline, so they're dying. As far as the idea of doing a series on compiling, um, so here's my here's my suggestion. There's a book that's done by Aho and a whole class of people. It's called the Dragon Book. I think they're on the Purple Dragon Book now. But it started out when I learned compilers. It was called the Red Dragon Book. That to tell you how old that is. That goes back to the 80s. It's been around a while. It's been updated. Several vision revisions have done to it. But in all honesty, compilers have not changed all that much in their design. There's been new thinking around the the uh, ways to optimize them, but not as far as the basics on what you have to do to build a compiler. That was a two-semester course that I took for learning a compiler, and we actually built one at the end of it. That's not something I would want to attempt on a, on a video channel. <laughs> go buy the book. Go buy the Dragon book. It's got everything you need in it. Um, yeah. <laughs> You don't need me. That 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 book has been the standard for people that are building compilers uh, for the last 50 years, 40 years or something. Yeah, 40 years. So I don't think I could add anything that would be useful to that book. That's all I'm saying. Um, I'd like to learn more about open source and how it's being used in places like the Ukraine battlefield and other such modern wars. Um Okay. Well, I can't, I mean, Jacob, Jacob Durant asked that question. The, I can't, I can't tell you be, on the work that we did because it was classified. Um, that would, yeah, I don't look good in, a, in an orange jumpsuit. So yeah, it's, it doesn't go with the white beard. So yeah, that's not something I would want to talk about. Uh, as far as, as what's being done by other nations, I'm sure that military programs are generally classified because you don't want your enemy to know what your capabilities are. So, yeah, it's being used, but, yeah, it's not something that I can talk about or will talk about. So, yeah, I can tell you how I'm using it because none of my stuff is classified. So, um, uh, Gelogia asks, I like the home lab idea. Review Proxmux running PFSense or OpenSense and next generation firewalls. Pi-hole repurpose existing wireless router behind new, more capable and router firewalls. Yeah, so I talked to Willie Howell back around the end of December. So I'm hoping still I, w I want to get a collab with him because he knows firewalls way better. I'm not a networking guy. I'm, I'm an operating system guy. So he knows that area a lot better than I do. And I'd like to talk a little bit about next-gen firewalls as well. The, um, yeah, and PFSense, OpenSense are good places to start. As far as Pi-hole is concerned, you know, you, know, you, you there are, there are add-ons that are inside the package manager for PFSense that will take over those functions that Pi-hole does. So you don't need a separate router for that. Uh, you can you can just use what's in PFSense if you want to do that. I think um, Tom, uh, Tom Lawrence has several videos about that. You can go over to his channel and check those out. Uh, he's, he's, he's very interested in those kinds of things. So yeah, networking is not, I mean, I know enough to be dangerous, uh, but uh, it literally, no, just enough to be dangerous, but not, no expert. And, uh, and just, I, I, we had people that I would go and, and, uh, and get when I needed help with the design of a network. Cause that's, that's kind of one of those things where you really need someone that understands it cold, uh, in order to do that correctly. Cause the last thing you want is an outage. Like, uh, I think didn't Facebook have a recent outage that affected most 70% of their online cust long, online users recently yeah it was it was another catastrophic failure 
that that's what happens when you don't have the right people and your infrastructure is too big that anyone can understand it. One of the two there is going on. Um, let's see. Oscar said, I see a lot of AI being applied to apps, less so to operating systems. What do you think the future of Linux is? Will our OSs become AIs themselves? It's funny that you, you should ask that question because the Linux Foundation just put a blog post out a couple of weeks ago about permitting AI to be used to not only build the code that goes into Linux, but also to become part of the operating system. So they've kind of opened those doors already to allow that to come in, uh, for good or bad. I mean, I, I don't have an opinion on it one way or the other. It's just that, you know, that being dependent, here's my, here's, here's my problem. I, I, I trust people. I don't trust machines. So I'm like you. But I do want to know as much as I can about them to know what they're doing. So that's why that's why I spend time learning AIs, so that I can talk intelligently about it when somebody asks me. As far as one, one of the guys said um, in reply, the hero said, because you want operating systems to be the most solid piece of software out there. That's exactly right. You you don't want you don't want something to go uh, to go haywire, or down the down the wrong path and and break everything. Uh, they only allowed Rust lately, uh, yeah. But they have opened the doors for AI. Just saying, he says most apps incorporating AI are just sending a request to an open a API on the on a cloud, which is right. However, you can. Like I said, there's the LM, uh, there's the LM model, and there's also Olama that allows you to run it locally on your machine without touching the cloud. Now, I, it, I, it did notice that there was some traffic going back after the end of the session, which looks like it's updating um, what it learned uh, during the conversation. So, yeah, I would like to shut that off. Yeah, and finally, somebody asked me, "Why are you old?" That's part of growing. <laughs> it's part of living. That's where we go. We start we start as babies and we end up dead. So yeah, that, that's that's kind of the progression that we go through. So uh, yeah. <laughs> thank you for thinking that I'm the wisest Linux user there is. But no, I'm not. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not. I'm probably the stupidest Linux user you've ever met. But you know that I, I don't mind trying things and I I don't mind breaking stuff in the process. So. <clears throat> Uh, what is my screensaver? Oh, you mean back here? That's the HAL program. That's the HAL 9000. That thing hanging on the wall back there, that's that's the program that it runs. Um, it, it actually started out uh, as a, a screensaver, I think, uh, that runs back there. So if you watch on any of 2001 or 2010, you'll see that running on, I think there's 12 monitors. There's, there's 12 different pieces of that running on, on that's part of hell. So, yeah. That, so, <laughs> so what, I don't think I covered all your questions. So we're going to do this again next month. I'll try to do this once a month. I'll try to pick different times so that it gives people a chance. I have a lot of users that are around the world. And so not everybody is from the U S um, so yeah, we'll do that and, uh, and try to, um, let me look at you when I'm talking instead of looking away. Sorry. Um, it's much easier to just write, vi do videos because I don't, I don't have to, I don't have to, uh, watch what I'm doing so much. Hopefully I can fix that problem where I have to keep looking over at a different display in order to do this. I would like to have it here in front of me. So, uh, but yeah, we'll get that, we'll get that worked out. So, I, uh, Joe, how are we doing? Right, Joe from Tech for Fun, are you still here? How are we doing on? Um, how are we doing on your uh, Joe's uh, units on your JRUs? Uh. 
<laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, and 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 thank you, Cleet, for uh, asking people to, to like and subscribe. I do appreciate that. So I think uh, I will get out of your way, let you go on with your day. I see it's been about an hour. So uh, we'll try to keep this up. Um, and uh, and and let you bring questions. I'll I'll open a community tab for the next month, and we can talk about that. So, um, thank you all for watching. I sure appreciate your taking the time to listen to some old guy ranting about the good old days, which I'm, I hope that's not the impression you came away with, because I don't think the old days were the good old days. 